Hi. In this video, I want to talk about the different types of organic and chemical sedimentary rocks that we uh, commonly encounter, particularly uh, in A-level geology. Now, organic sedimentary rocks are uh, the accumulated remains of um, organisms, things that were once alive. And that can be uh, animal fossils or plant fossils. Let's look at some examples. This is a rock, sometimes called a shelly limestone, other times a bioclastic limestone, where we have uh, a large proportion of the rock made from uh, fossil shell material. Now it's a limestone. So it's predominantly made of calcite. So here we have shells that are made uh, of calcite, they're bivalve shells. And we also have uh, a cement or a matrix uh, made of calcite as well. It's a fairly common um, shallow marine uh, sediment. And you will come across this in your geological studies. This is another common type of limestone. Uh, we call it sometimes a, a reef limestone or a coral limestone. Here we see uh, well-preserved coral fossils, making up a substantial proportion of the rock. Those corals, when they're alive, were trapping sediment uh, around them. Uh, calcite being precipitated uh, from the sea, uh, particularly in warm, uh, tropical, uh, shallow seas within uh, larger coral reefs. It's a very distinctive rock, but sometimes we do need to look carefully at the rock, um, particularly at the fossils, to find the distinctive radial pattern of scepter that tells us that the lighter colored parts of this rock are fossils and not clasts. This is a different type of limestone. Again, it's organic, and it's a very distinctive um, deposit. This is chalk. It's very soft and crumbly, has a, a very high porosity and permeability. And the reason it's uh, an organic uh, limestone is that it's a very pure uh, calcite because this rock is made almost entirely of the shells of microorganisms called coccoliths. If you put acid on this, it will fizz um, you know, quite violently. Deeper sea deposit, where we have this, um, these planktonic organisms dying and settling to the seabed in vast numbers. If we look at a close-up of chalk, this is a, an electron microscopic view, we can see the detail of the fossil shells. But this particular uh, photo, uh, scanning electron microscope view shows us the scale. That scale bar at the bottom there is only five microns across, five millionths of a meter. They're incredibly small organisms. organisms. You're not going to see them even using a uh, hand lens or even a microscope. As well as limestones, we can also find organic sediments that are made from plant material, specifically coal. Coal is the um, altered remains of plant material. Certainly in Europe and in other parts of the world, most of this is from the late Carboniferous. During a time when Pangaea was coming together, we have uh, a large area of uh, landmass around the equator, and that's our, our coal forming belt. The trees had evolved by this stage, uh, the environment was right, and we think perhaps even uh, the bacteria to break down uh, dead 
tree material hadn't evolved. Combine that with these uh, tropical climates and uh, swamps with anaerobic conditions, and we have the ideal combination of events to create coal. This is a, a reconstruction of what we think the coal forming swamps would have looked like. Areas here in South Wales uh, would have resembled this. This is what our the coal field here would have been like maybe 300 million years ago. Now, as I said before, coal has altered, it's changed. We get um, coal has to be pressure cooked to turn it from uh, wood or plant material into coal. That involves compression, so 12 meters of wood material will produce one meter of high quality coal. It needs to be buried uh, with more sediment. Volatiles and so water gases need to be squeezed out of uh, the rock. And as a result, carbon will increase. We see, as a consequence, a series of coals of what we call different ranks. This graph shows us the change uh, in the composition of these coals of different ranks. Notice in particular the proportion of carbon. So as we go from peat to lignite to bituminous coal to anthracite, we see an increase in the amount of carbon. This is reflected as well in the appearance of these sediments. This is peat, partly decomposed plant material. You can still see um, recognizable fragments of plants within this uh, deposit. It's quite low density, relatively low carbon content. Uh, it does burn, um, not terribly well, gives off a, a lot of smoke, although it can have quite a, a, a nice smell to it. Uh, but there's a lot of uh, waste material. This is uh, burned in, in places like the west of Ireland, the far northwest of Scotland, where perhaps other fuels are going to be unavailable or very expensive. With some more pressure and a bit of temperature, that peat will turn into lignite or brown coal. We've got higher carbon content, it's a bit darker, it's a bit denser, uh, it's a bit harder, but this is pretty terrible coal. Uh, there's a lot of smoke, a lot of pollution created uh, from burning this, a lot of ash um, uh, left over after it's burned. Generally, this isn't used as a fuel. By the time we get to bituminous coal, we've got much higher carbon content, up to about 85%. Uh, it's the distinctive black color. Um, but this one tends to be sort of uh, dull in appearance. We don't see much in the way of uh, the original plant material. Uh, and this was the, the main type of coal that used to be used uh, to manufacture uh, coke for blast furnace, for domestic use, uh, to produce a dreadful stuff called town gas. Um, it's, it's a common type of coal, certainly commonly used. The very best type of coal, though, is called anthracite. Very high proportion of carbon. Uh, when you pick it up, it, it's, it's harder, it's denser than other coals. Um, it's clean when you touch it, uh, it tends to be quite shiny, um, almost a metallic luster, uh, and this burns very well. Uh, you get a lot of heat, uh, not a great deal of smoke uh, and little ash left, because it's mostly carbon. This is the stuff that the, uh, the South, Wales, South Wales coal field was famous for. This is what made South Wales coal so good. Chemical sedimentary rocks, then, are where we get precipitation of uh, minerals uh, from solution. And we get a few distinctive types of sedimentary rock. This is a Neolithic limestone. This particular one uh, is the stone that makes uh, the buildings in Bath very famous. Here we have these little spherical balls of calcite called ooids. 
um, formed by precipitation of calcite around some kind of nucleus uh, that then gets washed around uh, in the waves in a warm, shallow sea. It's a very distinctive type of limestone. It will, of course, fizz with acid, but it's those spherical balls that are formed by accumulation of calcite uh, down to precipitation that make it distinctive. If we look at a thin section of this, we can see the internal structure showing these um, layers that have built up around that uh, that nucleus. That could be a, a small grain of silt or it could be a, a fossil or something like that. This stuff is still forming today in these warm, shallow environments. More commonly, but perhaps less excitingly, is micrite, a carbonate mud. This is uh, chemically precipitated calcite, and it creates just this fine-grained, often grey, uh, limestone. Uh, it can contain fossils, but it's it's perhaps not the most exciting sediment um, that we'll find, but it is a very common type of limestone. This is formed in environments where we get lots of evaporation from the sea, perhaps, uh, again, warm, shallow seas, perhaps without very much wave action, um, and just sort of slowly accumulating uh, this limey mud. The other place we can get chemical sediments are in what we call player lakes. These are lakes in desert environments, like this particular one, uh, in Death Valley. Unusually, this one's quite quite lumpy. Uh, often, salt flats uh, are, are very flat, where land speed records tend to be set. Where we have uh, a lake in the desert, often the only uh, exit for the water from that lake is by evaporation. So any minerals dissolved within the lake will be uh, left behind we see a sequence of this deposition, depending on how much water is needed to evaporate for these things to actually precipitate, which is related to the solubility of these minerals. So carbonate minerals like calcite uh, will be the first to precipitate, perhaps with only 60% of the uh, lake water uh, evaporated. Sulfate minerals like gypsum, we need more than 80% to be uh, evaporated before precipitation starts. The halide minerals, like halite, uh, we need more than 90% to go, because that's that's more soluble uh, than gypsum. Okay, Gypsum will dissolve in water, but slowly. If you lick it, you won't be able to taste it. But if you lick halite, because it dissolves very quickly, you will taste it. Finally, potassium and magnesium salts are the very last to be deposited. Virtually all the water needs to have been evaporated before those will come out of solution. So we find uh, these precipitate, uh, well, these evaporite deposits formed by precipitation in places where um, uh, desert lakes or even very shallow seas have dried up. They're really important resources. Um, we, we do use these materials for, for quite a few uh, different uses. And you even get very uh, beautiful ones, like these desert roses. Um, this is uh, gypsum precipitated um, in these uh, coastal salt flats. Uh, this particular one from Tunisia. So, as we see the sunset of these Tunisian salt flats, uh, and we see conclusions, of course, uh, in Arabic, these Organic and chemical sediments have their own distinctive features and properties, like all other rocks, that reflect how they form. It's important for us as geologists to be able to recognise these features and to use those to interpret uh, the processes that led to their formation. Don't forget to come up with your interesting question. I'll see you in class.